the X-Men are an extremely popular team of mutants in the Marvel Universe. They were first introduced in 1963's The X-Men, written by Marvelous Stan Lee and illustrated by legend Jack Kirby. The comic wasn't too popular then, and soon after, issue number 66 had to be republished as a different number just to stay in the public eye. In 1975, Len Wein took on writing duties and Dave Cockrum illustrated giant-sized X-Men number one. This new version of the X-Men launched the team into popularity. Meanwhile, a new superstar comic book artist got the chance to illustrate the X-Men in Uncanny X-Men number 248. That man was Jim Lee. He first worked on Alpha Flight and Punisher War Journal before being tested on X-Men and eventually getting Summer 1991's X-Men Volume 2 number 1. This comic sold over 8 million copies, making it the highest selling comic book of all time. What would Marvel do with all of Mr. Lee's talent? Marvel trading cards first came about in 1966. At least in my research, these were the oldest Marvel trading cards. Okay, maybe not trading cards, but stickers the size of trading cards. These were produced by Don Russ and were called Marvel Super Heroes Bubblegum. They were standard stickers with a Marvel character and a saying. In 1975, Topps took over the Marvel sticker game and gave us a few series. By 1986, a company called Comic Images took the stickers and created a few albums to collect your stickers in. In 1988, they moved Marvel into the trading card biz with The World of Spider-Man Trading Cards. The next year, they busted out a few card series, including the Excalibur Trading Card Collection, popular artist Arthur Adams Trading Card Collection, and the even more popular artist Todd, Todd McFarlane Ford, Trading Card Water Collection. Of Spawn. In 1990, Marvel yet again moved to another card company, Impel. Here's a quick history of Impel. In 1990, Leggett Group Inc. was a U.S. tobacco company, and it changed its name to Brook Group Limited, and split off into two subsidiaries, Leggett Group Inc. and Impel Marketing Inc. Leggett took care of the tobacco products, and Impel would do the non tobacco products. In April 1992, Impel changed his name to Skybox. They had Magic Johnson as their spokesperson. Snow was falling on the ground. What did I do? I went out and shoveled the snow. Made me a path on the basketball court. Had my mittens on, I'm shooting. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Oh, it's raining outside, huh? Raining? So what? <laughs> the door was shut in your face sometimes, but you still keep going. You still keep going. NBA Hoops basketball cards from Skybox. Or you dream it, see it, go after it. They created milk caps called Sky Caps in 1993. The first Sky Caps were DC Sky Caps, and later they would be found with Playmate Star Trek action figures as cards with a pog that could be popped out. In 1995, Marvel Entertainment bought Skybox and merged it with their own FLIR, which they had purchased at the end of July 1992. It was now FLIR Skybox. FLIR Skybox would then be purchased by Upper Deck in 2006 
where they produce cards under FLIR, Ultra FLIR, FLIR Tradition, Flare, and FLIR Greats of the Game. The last FLIR branded baseball cards appeared in 2007. Got it? Okay, let's go back to 1990. The United States was in the middle of a trading card and comic book boom. Impel's first job with Marvel was Marvel Universe Series 1. This base set was 162 cards deep and they were nothing like the previous Marvel cards, uh, stickers. There was an image of a character, team, event, or comic book cover and the reverse side would include information on each thing. They also included five hologram cards. The next year, they continued their success with Marvel Universe 2. This set was also 162 base cards and five holograms. These cards included better art and better overall design. They also included power ratings for the characters. The success of the two Marvel Universe card sets gave Marvel the idea to produce three card series a year. The first trading card set would be of a team or a character. The second set was the large set, aka the Marvel Universe trading cards. And the third set would feature a single artist. This evolved into Marvel masterpieces. So, who would be the first card set of in 1992? The year is 1991, and what is the biggest thing that happened to Marvel? X-Men Volume 2, Number 1, illustrated by Jim Lee. This comic book is the best-selling comic book of all time, and there is no way that any other comic book ever produced will ever, ever, ever sell over 8 million copies. That same year, Toy Biz also released their popular Uncanny X-Men action figures. Jim Lee was asked to illustrate the Uncanny X-Men 100 card set. It would be a solo job, and the only way it would work was if Jim Lee would continue to work on the X-Men comic book on top of doing the pencils for the cards. Did I say pencils? I meant pencils and inks. Paul Mounts would do the colors and even some of the backgrounds. Mounts has colored for Fantastic Four, and friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Some of the backgrounds would be what he called wrapping paper, and it really did look like wrapping paper. The design of the cards are simple yet iconic. The borders are a solid color with repeated silver X's on them. The heroes have cyan borders. The villains have a maroon border. The teams have a magenta border, and the XX-Men allies, and eight of the Danger Room puzzle cards all have teal borders. These cards also have an extra gimmick that I didn't know about before doing the research for this video. The large X on the lower right hand corner of each card is a different color. This is supposed to represent the character's team affiliation or what team they associate with. The blue X is the X-Men Blue Strike Force. The yellow X is the X-Men Gold Strike Force and Villains. The red X is for Excalibur. The purple X is for X-Factor. And the black X is for X-Force. The Danger Room puzzle cards were the first puzzle cards in the Marvel line. The back of the cards, or Cerebro Scan, have a completely different image of the character, usually in their civilian clothing. It also has power rating, a quick bio, and extra fact. The reverse of the puzzle cards read more like a Cerebro file. They have the subject, a Danger Room test sequence number, and extra fact about the Danger Room. There are also five gold foil holographic cards. They include Wolverine, Cable, Gambit, Magneto, and the X-Men. 
the reverse side shows the image in a non-holographic form. A checklist of the holograms, and the same bio that is on the base set for that character. The last card on this set is the checklist. The face is exactly what you would expect. A list of all the cards, and the reverse has info on Cerebro and an extra fact on it. Before the cards were released, there were promotional cards given away at card shops. The packs contained five cards, Wolverine, Cable, Storm, Magneto, and the X-Men Gold Team. The final release included 2,000 cards that were signed in silver marker by Jim Lee. Oh, but you can't just take one of these X-Men cards and have Jim Lee sign them at a convention and then call it a 1992 signature. That's because those cards were also embossed with the Impel logo. At the 1992 San Diego Comic Convention, Mr. Lee signed 5,000 cards provided by Comics Express. These cards are different from the final release cards since one side has a photo of Mr. Lee at his desk. The final boxes released featured Wolverine in his X-Men training suit and the other with Magneto. Each box contains 36 packs and each pack contains 6 cards. There are also collector's tins. They are limited to 7,500. This tin includes the entire set of cards, puzzle cards, and the holograms. But there is one card that is not in the base set. The power ratings card, which explains the, well, power ratings. The art on the cards are beautiful and there's no filler. Even the characters that aren't that popular have a great card. I mean, I might be dumb for this, but who's Gatecrasher? I don't know, but she seems interesting thanks to Mr. Lee's work. Some of my favorites have become so much cooler because of his art. The look of most of the characters became the standard in Marvel for many years to come. One major exception is Wolverine. He is more known for his yellow tiger stripe uniform than the brown one of the 1980s and early 90s. The summer release of the cards was a huge success and others noticed. If you were a member of the Fox Kids Club, you might recall a little magazine called Totally Kids Magazine. In the November 1992 issue, you would get to a page that contained four paper X-Men cards. The cards were Wolverine, Storm, Cyclops, and Jubilee. These cards had the same art as the Impel Uncanny X-Men cards. The text on the reverse side is the same as the Impel cards, except that they didn't have the extra facts. The cards were also a new feature of the magazine. In Japan, the cards were released with a perforated circle over the character. It could then be removed and the character was now a pog. Much like what Skybox would do later on with Skycaps. Even sticker machines had the cards. They were those shiny prism stickers, but they all had a badly printed version of the cards art on them. The cards were so popular that an enterprising individual made bootlegs of them and sold them in the Filipino market. The pack featured an illustration of one of the 80s X-Men team with Colossus, Wolverine, Cyclops, Nightcrawler, and a white and blonde Mohawk Storm. They were called Uncanny Action, Uncanny X-Men cards. The X-Men cards were even used as the design bible for the X-Men in the 1990s. At Marvel, if somebody needed to check a character's design, they would just get an X-Men card passed to them, and that was that.
in 2017 for the 25th anniversary of the Uncanny X-Men trading cards, Marvel decided to make use of the Jim Lee card art with new colorists as variant covers throughout their titles. Some of them made sense, like Jean Grey for X-Men Blue, Cable for Cable, and of course my girlfriend Jubilee for Generation X. But others, not so much. I mean, what's Shadowcat doing as the cover for Spider-Man or Gambit on Steve Rogers' Captain America? In 2019, under the Marvel 80th Anniversary banner, Hasbro released some Marvel Legends sets with the Uncanny X-Men trading card motif. These three sets were a two-pack of Havoc and Polaris, a three-pack of Wolverine, Jean Grey, and Cyclops dubbed by fans as the Love Triangle set, and an Excalibur 3-pack of Megan, Captain Britain, and Shadowcat with Lockheed. The boxes are in that familiar blue with X's and it looks pretty darn cool. It also has some images of the cards on the back. In July 2021, the latest X-Men books began to be released. Russell Dodderman created some art of the team members and they were put into the Uncanny X-Men trading card border. These became the variant covers to X-Men Volume 6. The back of these comics even have the same style as the back of the cards. They include power ratings and even the extra facts. 1992's Uncanny X-Men trading cards are legendary. They are still beautiful to look at even 30 years later. They haven't aged much. In fact, one could say that with nostalgia, they've become better. The cards continue to be an inspiration, so much so that it inspired a book that contains all the cards and tons of information on how the process of creating the cards went. The Uncanny X-Men Trading Cards, the complete series. They even include four trading cards, one of the Danger Room puzzle completed and three more puzzle cards that create the cover of X-Men Volume 2, number one. I've had this video in my back pocket for two years, and thanks to my buddy Jamelin and this book he got me, I finally knew how and where to start. In my older age, I still think about the X-Men just like this, as I'm sure most Gen Xers and Xennials do. This is an amazing part of Marvel comic book history that lasts a lifetime.